Uh, welcome everyone to the press conference at WTO on domestic uh, services regulation. My name is Crispin Conroy, and I am the representative director of the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, based here in Geneva. I'll be moderating the press conference today. And for those of you not physically present, I'm sitting separately while our, spe our speakers are seated together in a traditional pan panel structure. And this is clearly for social distancing purposes. We will have approximately 30 minutes for the session. Before I introduce the speakers, let me say a few words of introduction. For those of you who don't know ICC, we are the World Business Organization, the institutional representative of over 45 million companies, micro, small, medium, and large, in over 110 countries, with over 60% of our representation in the developing world. And as end users of the international trading system, business is a strong supporter of the World Trade Organization. And we look to this organization through its members to produce rules that meet the needs of modern economies and businesses worldwide. For that reason, I'm very pleased to be moderating the press conference today because the successful conclusion of discussions on services domestic regulation that our speakers will soon present is a significant and positive outcome for business. Now, this outcome is clearly a group, group effort of all participating members, but it has also been driven by individuals. On behalf of I, ICC, let me pay tribute to the lead delegations who are with us here today, Costa Rica, Australia, and the EU, and also to the Director General herself, Dr Ngozi, ICC is very grateful for your dynamic and strategic leadership and for your willingness to engage with stakeholders, both business and civil society. And through you, let me thank your team, some of who are with us today, today in the room. Their support of this initiative has been superb. ICC has worked with them and with the lead delegations on advocacy on services domestic regulation within our network. And we certainly look forward to continuing this engagement in the important implementation phase. Now, let me introduce the speakers today in the order that they will speak. Her Excellency Ambassador Gloria Abraham of Costa Rica, and of course, the Director General of the, the WTO, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wella, uh, His Excellency uh, um, George Mina of Australia, and Ambassador uh, Joao Aguila Machado of the European Union. Once we have heard their presentations, I will open the floor for questions. And let me remind the participants, please, that these questions should be focused on this current initiative. And also please introduce yourself and your organization. Questions can be sent through the Q&A or, or by raising your hand. So let me first introduce uh, Ambassador Abraham. Uh, to make the first presentation. Ambassador, over to you, and could you please use your microphone? Thank you. Thank you, Crispin. I'm very pleased uh, to announce uh, that we have successful conclude the negotiations of the Services Domestic Regulation Joint Initiative here today. Here we have. Sixty-seven WTO members, accounting for over 90% of global services trade, are part of today's outcome. Today, we mark a historic momentum for the WTO, the first negotiated outcome on services in a quarter of a century. It has been an honor for Costa Rica to chair these negotiations through a through a, to a successful outcome. And I would like to thank the European Union and Australia for their leadership role in the initiative and all of the other participating members who have worked tirelessly for the past four years to get us to this point. We regret that we were not able to conclude our negotiations with the participation of our ministers and a capital-based colleagues. The ministerial meeting of domestic regulation GSI was planned to take place exactly today during the MC12 
that was unfortunately postponed because of COVID-related developments. We are, however, very pleased to, that the GSI participants share our determination to urgently conclude negotiations anyway here in Geneva with the participation of ambassadors and heads of delegations. I will now pass the floor to the Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iwela for her remarks. Dr. Ngozi, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Peralta. I congratulate participants in the Joint Initiative on Services Domestic Regulation for successfully concluding their negotiations despite the disruptions around the postponement of the ministerial com conference. This is really an exciting moment, a fantastic moment for all of the participants who negotiated this agreement for businesses in the service sector, as Crispin said, especially the small, micro, medium, and small enterprises. And for the WTO, I want to thank you all for your hard work and also thank our hardworking secretariat staff who persevered and supported this throughout. The outcome agreed today will cut red tape and facilitate services trade, enhancing transparency, predictability, and efficiency for licensing and authorization procedures. It will lower trade costs, particularly more regulated backbone services, such as transport, finance, and communications. The OECD and WTO estimates it will lower services trade costs by as much as $150 billion per year. If you look at this alongside the roughly $1.2 trillion worth of traded merchandise covered by tariff cuts under the 2015 expansion of the Information Technology Agreement, a long-standing WTO plurilateral, something becomes clear. Deals reached at the WTO have serious commercial impact. They may not always make it into the headlines, they may not sound sexy, but I assure you they matter a lot to companies' bottom lines, and that means they also serve people. In addition to lowering services trade costs, more cost-effective access to services also promises to boost the competitiveness of manufacturing and agriculture businesses, since services are an increasingly critical input for those sectors. The services business community has strongly supported this outcome in the four years since the process was launched. The agreement directly responds to problems they report in their trade operations, uh, non-transparent and unpredictable regulatory environments, multiple layers of bureaucracy and so on. It's an example of how members are addressing important issues for 21st com century commerce right here at the WTO, from services domestic regulation to e-commerce and enhancing the integration into global trade of women owned businesses and micro, small and medium enterprises. Let me end by saying I'm particularly happy that uh, negotiations proceeded, proceeded and were uh, finalized for services domestic regulation because it shows that despite postponement of the MC12, the WTO is working, the WTO is delivering. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador and, and Director General. I apologize, I got the order wrong. I'd like to now pass to Ambassador Machado of the uh, European Union. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here today together with Costa Rica and Australia, as well as the Director General, uh, Dr. Ngozi, to announce the conclusion of these negotiations that are important for the WTO and for the global economy. We have heard your call, uh, Director General, to continue working despite the postponement of the ministerial meeting and to deliver good news from the WTO. And this is exactly why we are here today, to announce the conclusion of these negotiations with the participation of 67 WTO members, accounting for more than 90% of global services trade. These are very good news, which should encourage all of us to continue working hard to deliver also on the other multilateral outcomes. So what is this outcome about? Services is the largest and fastest growing sector of today's global economy. However, 
complex and unpredictable rules and procedures limit trading services significantly. The rules that we have agreed in this negotiation will align regulatory and administrative practices and make trading conditions clearer, more predictable, and more transparent. Micro, small, and medium-sized companies will especially benefit from this, as very often they do not have sufficient resources to deal with complex procedures. These savings can also make a critical contribution to supporting business in the post-COVID economic recovery. And for the first time in a WTO negotiation, we have also concluded and agreed a specific rule on non-discrimination between men and women, supporting women's economic empowerment and laying the foundation for further work on this topic at the WTO. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, um, Ambassador Mina, can I please pass to you your presentation? Thank you, Crispin, and welcome, colleagues. Um, we are back in business in rulemaking at the WTO. This is a historic day. These are the first set of global services trade rules for a quarter of a century. Uh, it's been a bittersweet kind of week. Uh, ministers were to be here this week at the WTO, heralding in a new set of rules across the agenda. Uh, obviously, that has not been possible, and uh, we've had the disappointment of the postponement of MC12. Uh, that, that doesn't stop the, the sweet news of today, which is uh, that we have a big boost for the WTO's rulemaking function. We have uh, an initiative that will give global services trade boost uh, a boost of $150 billion annually, and we have an initiative that will create new ways to access global markets for small and medium-sized businesses and for developing and least developed countries globally. So this is great news out of the WTO system and we should herald it and cel celebrate it. Uh, I was speaking to a freight business last night. They have global operations. They want to bring a whole range of developing and least developed countries into the global economy, uh, they found that this initiative has the potential to significantly, significantly improve the access of a range of countries, including in Africa, into uh, global markets and to boost e-commerce where uh, licensing and regulation can be a significant barrier. So this should give us a boost, not only for the economic benefits it brings to the global services economy, but also to the business of rulemaking here at the WTO. We've got a very significant agenda that we're continuing to work on right now in this building, including on, on fisheries subsidies to boost the sustainability of our oceans, including on agriculture, where we need to boost global food security through addressing distortions, uh, such as through subsidies, and of course, through the response to the pandemic uh, with uh, uh, the world watching uh, this place and its continuing efforts to, to boost supply uh, and distribution of vaccines. So a big agenda to continue with. Uh, today's news, I think, is a, is a great boost for, for all of us involved in this initiative, but for the WTO more generally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mina. And look, I'd like to, to conclude the presentations by saying how important it is for ICC to be asked to moderate this event. Uh, as I think all speakers have noted, this is a significant out outcome for business, small, medium, and large all over the world, but also a delivery for uh, the WTO, which is also what business wants. So thank you again. Now, let, let me uh, first move to some an online question, which uh, I'll read it out. Um, if understood correctly, the deal on domestic regulation services is basically a plurilateral agreement. 
If so, how do uh, LDCs, including Bang Bangladesh, benefit from the agreement? And the, the writer, uh, Mr. Rashid Al-Islam from Bangladesh asks uh, whether any LDCs have indeed joined the deal. So perhaps um, looking at the panelists, Ambassador Mina, could I ask you to respond to that? Thank you. Sure, Crispin, just very briefly, there are no uh, least developed countries as yet in the deal. The next stage of this initiative is to continue to expand its reach. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a range of global businesses who do believe that this deal will benefit least developed countries in two ways. First, by ensuring that they have access for their exporters into others' markets. And second, if they were to join the initiative, by some of the regulatory benefits that they will derive by looking at the best practices that others have followed and adopting those. Now, there is important flexibility built into this agreement, such that LDCs do not have to uh, adopt all of the, uh, the requirements until they graduate. Uh, so there's already a mechanism to encourage LDCs into it. We're looking to build support for uh, that sort of outreach as we, as we track to implementation from next year. Great, thank you very much, Ambassador Mina. Uh, I also see some hands up now from the virtual participants. So let me start please with Ram Etuera. I'm not sure if I have that uh, um, pronounced right. Uh, could you please unmute yourself and then we'll, we'll listen through our headphones. Yes, uh, greetings to all of you. I have one question for Dr. Ngozi. Uh, my first question is, I do not understand the presence of the ICC at, at this press briefing. Can you exp explain that to me, please? My second question is, what message you have to give today to the 97 members of the WTO who are absent from this joint initiative? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ram. Uh, the ICC is a, a very strong partner of ours, um, and it's not unusual to find us uh, working with them. It's the International Chambers of Commerce. They also keep us uh, plugged into what is uh, good for business, but particularly they've been able to plug us into the micro, small and medium, small and medium enterprises who are also their members. Uh, this is uh, one aspect of this agreement that I think will be particularly beneficial. So we asked uh, Crispin to moderate because uh, of that partnership. And uh, with respect to the 97 other members who are not, uh, 97 members who have not joined, well, uh, the initiative remains uh, uh, open, uh, inclusive. Uh, they can join at any time that they would like to, to do so. And I hope that they will. You know, sometimes in these plurilaterals, you start with a, a, a small number and it grows over time as people look in and, and discover what is in it uh, for them uh, and, and what they could benefit from it. So I hope that more members will look into this agreement. It is exciting because uh, as Ambassador Mina said uh, and Ambassador Machado, in, this is the first in a quarter century and it shows that uh, the WTO is capable of responding to present issues of the day and making rules. Uh, it's a rules-based organization, thank you. Thank you, Director General, and thank you, uh, Ram, for your question. Uh, could I now call on Jana Dreyer, please, of Borderlex? Could you introduce yourself? Hello. Does everyone hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, I'm Jana Dreyer, the founder and editor of Borderlex, a trade, uh, poli trade policy website. I have um, slightly technical questions in a way, or, or, about the, or more about the nature of the deal. You say there are 67 members that participate. To date, there seem to be only 41 schedules that have formally been um, filed. Uh, am I correct? And what does that mean about, you know, uh, when are you expecting the full 67 schedules to be filed? Um, uh, that's one thing. And then on, um, because this is a very specific way of 
you know, uh, in integrating new rules into the WTO galaxy without having the whole signature and the ratification method. Do you foresee any hiccups in the uh, in this uh, certification process for the services schedules going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Jana, for the for the question or two questions. Perhaps Ambassador Machado, could I ask you to respond to those two? Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the question. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, uh, there are uh, currently uh, 41 uh, schedules of commitments on the table, counting the European Union as one. As you know, the EU has 27 members, and the schedule of the EU is on behalf of the 27 EU member states. Uh, if you got in terms of the participants, you come to 67. But there are also some of the participants in this negotiation, besides the EU, there are a couple that were not able to present the schedule in time for today, but made a commitment that from here to February or March, uh, they are going to submit. So uh, you, uh, the number of schedules do not correspond exactly to the number of countries that are announcing the participation, but they made a commitment and this afternoon again at uh, the moment that we close the negotiation that they will be sending uh, in the next two, three months, they needed to complete some domestic uh, procedures. Now, all the participants or some have to do uh, domestic procedures to complete the negotiation and after which we will launch the certification uh, procedure in the WTO. Uh, we expect not to have hiccups uh, because, uh, uh, as was explained uh, by the Director General and uh, Ambassador Mina, the participants in this negotiation agreed to grant the benefits deriving from this negotiation, not only to themselves, but to the non-participants. So the non-participants are benefiting from the improvement on commitments in services that the 67 have made. So uh, I see no reason uh, that uh, you will have an a negative impact and that uh, we should have difficulties during the certification procedure. So uh, we hope that everyone will be acting in with good reason and uh, uh, thinking about the greater good which is in this pandemic period, the benefits that companies will have, particularly the smaller ones uh, will have, and also uh, these uh, novelties that we have introduced, like non-discrimination between men and women. I think it's more important not to lose that picture uh, rather than being uh, 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 stuck with uh, uh, minor issues. But again, our hope is that uh, we will be able to get uh, the schedule certif certified. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And also, thank you for the question. I have time just for two more questions, I think, before the Director General needs to leave. One is in the Q&A, which is, uh, I guess, um, the benefits of the, the, the agreement for, uh, for underdeveloped countries. The question is, what can be done for an underdeveloped country like Nepal? Um, who would like to take that question? Um, Ambassador Mina, are you happy to do that? Absolutely uh, happy to, to take that on, Crispin. We, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, there are significant advantages to adopting good regulatory practices, uh, whether they be in licensing, qualifications, uh, or the like. Uh, there are, uh, and, and you'd know well, uh, knowing that region, uh, so, some very significant uh, tourism, transport, uh, freight uh, uh, businesses that can that can benefit. And in fact, uh, we know of an example of of a of a, an exporter of tourism services from that region. I won't name the particular country, uh, who faces a a gender barrier because licenses offered for tourism operators in her market uh, are not typically offered unless the licensee is male. So this initiative for small businesses, for businesses who rely on, on, on licensing and qualification requirements, 
for businesses who might be impacted by gender. This is one of the unique features of this agreement is that it, it prevents discrimination based on gender. And I, I want to uh, point out and laud that particular feature of this initiative. Uh, this initiative can, can significantly assist the exporters from uh, countries such as, such as Nepal. Uh, the other thing I would say, Crispin, is that there is a, a lot in here that, that actually engenders flexibility for least developed countries, as we mentioned earlier, as they work through graduation uh, out of least developed country status, of course, they would have to adopt some of the, uh, the initiatives of the, of the agreement. Uh, but, but for those who are still in least developed country status, they have enormous flexibility in the implementation of the agreement. That's something that um, both Joao and uh, George have stressed. As far as I know, this is the first time in a WTO agreement we have concluded a specific rule on non-discrimination between men and women, uh, supporting women's economic empower empowerment and laying the foundation for further such work in, in WTO agreements. I think this is uh, particularly pleasing. So I'm, I'm glad that the ambassadors are stressing this, uh, this aspect. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Director General, also for, for reiterating that point. It's also something that is extremely important for the business community, and a lot of positive feedback from that from the ICC network on that in that regard. And thank you, Padel, for the, the question. As Ambassador Mina alluded to, I was fortunate enough to spend three years in, in Nepal, so I'm glad that we got a question from that country. I just have time for one more question and uh, then I'd like the panelists to make short concluding remarks. The question comes from Peter Ungvaporn. Uh, Peter, could you uh, introduce yourself please and take off the mute? Thank you. Good evening, I'm Peter Ungvaporn. I uh, have, have a blog and uh, do some freelance work. Um, it's a couple of things, one of them very quick. Um, Am I correct in understanding that it's only the schedules that will be legally binding? There will be no protocol or anything similar, any similar document that pre previously happened with services. But more, but more in more specifically, the schedules are pre-finalization schedules. What does it take to get them finalized and, and would they change? Ambassador Machado, I saw you nodding. Could you take that question, please? <laughs> or was it a shaking of the head? <laughs> well, uh, what happened? We agreed on a set of disciplines, on good regulatory uh, disciplines for certification authorization procedures that apply across the board to the different services sectors. And this is contained in a document that we call a reference uh, paper. Now, Members, how do they incorporate that in their commitments? Uh, each WTO member has a schedule of commitments. And now they indicate in the sectors that these reference disciplines on domestic regulations apply. So what we have seen is that all the participating members, uh, so many of them have already very extensive commitments in services. They have put in all their committed sectors that the disciplines apply. There were even cases of countries that, although they had not commitments in certain case, case sectors, they decided to include and to make commitments on domestic regulation to sectors that they had not yet committed. So the technique is a mixture of a reference paper and then uh, in the schedule, you indicate the sectors uh, to which you want this reference paper to apply. And that's the way that we are going to proceed. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm afraid we don't have any more time for further questions, but I just like, please, the panelists to make short concluding remarks, maybe in reverse order, with uh, Ambassador Abraham being the, the one to conclude. So, Ambassador Mina, could I start with you, please? Well, very briefly, Crispin, thank you for this opportunity. It is a historic day here at the WTO. We ought not underplay or underestimate the significance of the first set of global rules that have come into fruition since Nairobi 2015, the first set of global services rules for a quarter century. Uh, I think 
uh, we should take this as a as a as an important step forward in the in the practice of rulemaking here, uh, an important step forward in the global services economy, and uh, a confidence boost for everything we're trying to achieve here at the WTO. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Machalo, please. It's a very important day for all of us and for WTO. It's not only good news, it's very good news. Uh, it has been a very long time uh, that uh, the WTO had not delivered an outcome on rulemaking and in a sector that is so important for today's global economy as it is services. This uh, represents a collective effort uh, of members. Uh, the membership has increased over time and is open uh, to other members who want to join and will be welcomed. But above all, the message of today is yes, the WTO is open for business and is doing uh, things that are relevant for our life of today. We now need to go back to work and do uh, continue this work in the other multilateral fights. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Very good news indeed. And glad that uh, we're open for business. <laughs> Director General, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, following on what the ambassadors have said. Let me just say that prior to the pandemic, services trade was growing faster, much faster than goods trade. And services trade uh, is huge and will be huge for the future. So having rules that begin to underpin uh, services is, is really very, very uh, important. So I do think it is significant, it's historic that we've been able to do this after, after 24 years. It's just an example of what I say this organization can do. All the negotiations, plurilateral and multilateral, that have been uh, lingering for some time, we are capable of completing those uh, negotiations. So um, I, I'm glad we're back to rulemaking and all I can say is that this should give us the impetus to now complete some other negotiations on our plate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And could I pass to you Ambassador Abram for the concluding remarks? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Crispin, and thank you all of you to be with us uh, this, uh, this day, important day. With the conclusion of the negotiations, we must now turn, off, uh, turn our mind towards implementing domest these domestic regulations disciplines as quickly as possible for the benefit of our services exporters. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And once again, let me reiterate the importance of this day, not just for the WTO itself, but also for the business community. So thank you for the, the chance to be with you this, this evening. Thank you.